Papa, why didn't you stop them? I couldn't. The library was sinking. You guys are still inside and... It's a subtle little thing, but a lot of the time Toph doesn't actually look at the person she's talking to. I guess she wouldn't see the need, considering the whole eyes don't work thing. You just didn't care. You never liked Toph, but you wanted him gone. This accusation isn't totally without merit, actually. Pretty much the only time we've ever seen Toph talk to or about Appa in Aang's presence was when she said this. If there's anyone to blame, it's Shetty over here. What? You're blaming Appa? Yeah, you want to know how they keep finding us? He's leaving a trail everywhere we go! Also, you can see two little footprints in the sand behind Aang here. Not a big deal, but still nice. We better start walking. We're the only people who know about the solar eclipse. We have to get that information to Ba Sing Se. You think if we dig out the giant owl, he'll give us a ride? No, but I would like to see that. Someone draw that for me. Am I big enough on YouTube yet to just say stuff and then it happens? Probably not, right? There's no way. Maybe we should make camp. No, please. Don't stop just for me. So the idea here is that Ira was still hurting from when Azula dummied him. But I feel like the viewer would probably forget all of that at this point, right? He was up and around teaching Zuko how to redirect lightning, and we've had an episode of Buffer in between then and now. So I feel like it'd be pretty easy to forget why Ira's hamming it up right now. By the way, day 95 of saying justice for song. Colonel Monkey, what a pleasant surprise. You know these guys? Sure. Colonel Monkey and the Rough Rhinos are legendary. Would you like some tea first? I'd love some. How about you, Kachi? I make you as a Jasmine man. It's not every day we get to see Iroh be cocky. It's almost like Iroh's relaxed nature rolled over into him being so relaxed that he can still exude this chill energy even when his life and freedom are being threatened. I don't feel like a lot of characters could pull this kind of attitude off without it feeling edgy, but they characterized Iroh just right for this to work perfectly. Haha, <laughs> ever notice Iro do this little wave as this guy gets pulled away? The Yu Yan can fly to a tree from a hundred flies away without yards like killing the Yu Yan. We cut away right after this, so I guess the rough rhinos just stopped attacking? Maybe Komodo rhinos can't keep up with ostrich horses. It's nice to see old friends. Too bad you don't have any old friends that don't want to attack you. Hmm. Old friends that don't want to attack me. This brings an interesting thought to mind. Ira was at the Siege of the North, right? And of course, so was Paku. If they met up, what do you think would have happened? Would they be honor and duty bound to fight? Or would it just kind of be like a nod at each other and carry on kind of thing? You might think these are just shadows at first, but upon further inspection, there are actually sweat stains on the gang's clothes. We're drinking your bending water? You use this on the swamp guy! Wait, so Katara uses the same bending water all the time? She doesn't change it out every now and then at whatever body of water they happen onto? I guess it's a why would she kind of thing, but still. <gasps> There's water trapped inside these. I don't know. Suit yourself. It's very thirst quenching though. Okay, I think you've had enough. The meta absolutely has to be take some with you, but only drink as much as you absolutely have to and pray it doesn't completely send you, right? Also, has no one ever thought of cactus juice bending? What if Katara filled her water skin with this stuff and then just flung it at people's faces? Instant win. Who lit Toph on fire? There's actually a fire igniting sound effect if you listen closely here. Who lit Toph on fire? Pretty interesting that this got past Nickelodeon censorship. And by pretty interesting, I mean, how did this get past Nickelodeon censorship? Aang actually has tears in his eyes just for a second here before he freaks out. No! What is that? What? What is what? It's a giant mushroom. Maybe it's friendly! Sokka being high as hell is fun and all, but I think I'm sadly at the point in my life, or maybe just the point in my Avatar viewing experience, where I just don't really care about the Sokka is high gag very much at all. <gasps> Conventional dog. They went in the desert. Too bad there's almost no chance they survived. So wait, you're telling me this guy saw a girl take off on an enormous flying monster and he just thought, without a shadow of a doubt, yep. She's dead. This is a really cool shot. That's all. I like the shadows. What? I don't need to have crazy insight on everything. I can just like stuff. Come on, Aang. We can do this if we work together. Right, Toph? 
As far as I can feel, we're trapped in a giant bowl of sand pudding. So at this point, if I'm tough, I'm pissed. Her entire journey was like a week long. She got in a fight with her new friends, got to bully Aang for a little bit, and then sat outside of a tower for a while, and now is going to die from exposure in the desert. From Toph's perspective, this journey's been bunk as hell. I'm pretty sure that everyone comes to the decision that these things should be called vulture bees on their own, but their actual in-canon name are buzzard wasps. We're getting out of this desert, and we're gonna do it together. Aang, get up. Everybody, hold hands. We can do this. We have to. Katara really shines in this episode. Each of the rest of the team is out of it either emotionally, physically, or mentally. So Katara has to be strong for them in all three of those aspects. That headstrong and motherly nature can sometimes get her into trouble, but here we see the positive sides of it, and that's really cool. Fire Nation wanted posters. So? So, look who's here. It is a little convenient that Iroh's first instinct is to hit up a contact at the Misty Palms Oasis, the same place that the gang were at last episode, but those kind of coincidences happen so infrequently in this show, I'm gonna let it slide. Let's take them now! This place is full of desperate characters. If they find out we're collecting a bounty, we might have to fight them all just to keep our prize. <gasps> Wow, Master Yu actually preaches some proper neutral jing here. Maybe he's not as much of a dummy as he lets on. I see you favor the White Lotus Gambit. Not many still cling to the ancient ways. Those who do can always find a friend. Then let us play. This is a cool secret handshake. I don't know if I've ever actually seen anything like this in other fiction. A secret code in a board game? Super cool idea. Also, you can see Shin Fu and Yu still mean mugging our boys in the background in some of these shots. You two are wanted criminals with a giant bounty on your heads. I thought you said he would help. He is. Just watch. You think you're going to capture them and collect all that gold? Gold? What are you guys freaking out about? You're in a high society juice bar where one drink is one gold. You guys should be loaded. And so they just ditch Song's poor ostrich horse at the Shady Palms Oasis. Seriously, we never see it with them again because starting next episode, they're on the ferry. Fucked up, guys. Do I even need to say it? Has there been anything but a full moon this entire season? I'm serious. I don't think there has been. I think that this was just normal for this world, but it's shown in the last season that they do have a moon cycle. Pull it together, UA. Fly up and bend the water from that cloud into my pouch. I guess I'll take the time to talk about Aang in this episode. I feel like choosing to make Aang snappy and angry over the loss of his pet, the only thing that really ties him back to his old life 100 years ago, was a really smart choice. We're at the point where Aang has been so happy and reasonable now, that if you decided that he was in a bad mood over something smaller than this, it would have felt really out of character. So if you wanted to explore the side of his character, you needed something like this. Everyone can understand this, and everyone can empathize with the way he's feeling. So it just feels right, even though it's not the Aang we're used to seeing. I'm so sick of not feeling where I'm going! And what idiot buried a boat in the middle of the desert? They were gonna walk right by this. Ang or Katara didn't notice this at all. Maybe they just thought some weird wooden thing sticking under the ground wasn't worth looking at, I guess. It is an honor to welcome such a high-ranking member of the Order of the White Lotus. Being a Grand Master, you must know so many secrets. What kind of secrets do you think these guys deal with? Like political secrets? Or like nature of the universe secrets? The only explanation we ever really get is Zhang Zhang saying basically, Yep, yeah, we're into all the smart sound and stuff. The White Lotus has always been about philosophy, and beauty, and truth. What is your favorite color? Blue. Right, off you go. That's what the compass is pointing to. That giant rock. It must be the magnetic center of the desert. A rock? Yes! Let's go! Maybe we can find some water there. Maybe we can find some sandbenders. What a cool line. The same way that Iroh wasn't over the top earlier about being cocky. We know how angry Aang is and how hard it is to make him feel angry in the first place. So this line feels just right, not cheesy or edgy. Wait, they just straight up scaled this thing? Toph or Aang didn't feel the need to make it any easier? I think my head is starting to clear out the cactus juice. From the look in Momo's eyes, I'd say he's still pretty far gone. So there's this big rock near Toph now, but in the previous overhead shot, it didn't seem like there was anything near that size close to her. Also, the rock that Toph throws and the rock that ends up near Sokka don't look alike whatsoever. Good gear continuity again. Sokka was shown to have his machete when they were in the library, so it makes sense that he would have it here. Couldn't have left it on Appa. I'm not losing anyone else out here. On the bright side, Momo might not be scared at all right now. He might just be thinking like, man, am I tripping balls? Did a giant fucking bug just kidnap me? What's going on right now?
Hell yeah, I love seeing stuff like this. It's a moment of weakness for Aang, but we needed something like this from him. We've seen Aang happy, sad, and maybe angry in a quick moment here or there, but we've never seen him angry to the point of probably breaking one of his most deeply held beliefs. I do think this thing died, honestly. It got knocked out of the sky, and even if it didn't die from that, that landing didn't look exactly soft either. But yeah, we need an entire emotional spectrum from a character to make them feel real, and this episode really helps in that respect for Aang. What's going on? Is the club meeting over? Man, that club meeting took all night? You made Zuko stand out here all night? That's cold, Iroh, damn. Sorry, father. I recognize the son's voice. He's the one that stole Appa. This works pretty poorly to me, actually. In Appa's lost days, we hear this guy talk. Put a muzzle on it! but we didn't last episode. I feel like this moment could have worked a lot better if we could have had this realization along with Toph instead of having her just tell us. Hey you, where are these men? I got a tip that they're in your shop. As you can see, no one is here but us. This guy actually sounds and resembles the guy from behind the door earlier. Who knocks at the garden gate? So I guess that explains where this guy came from. We know all about your secret back room. Kick it down. Hey, that room is for flowers only! This is a good visual joke. He kicks down everything but the door. Ha <laughs> ha! And thus ends me explaining the joke. That always makes it better. Also, this room has a white lotus decal on the floor. I'll bet you missed that. You said to put a muzzle on him. You muzzled Appa? Aang's eyes and head tattoos start to glow here, but the tattoos on his hands aren't glowing yet. I figured they would all turn on at the same time, you know? It's weird that the first thing Avatar State Aang does is something that Aang did without the Avatar State about 30 seconds prior. You'd think he'd do something a little more bombastic. This is the first time Toph is seeing, or I guess feeling and hearing, Aang like this. So this reaction makes sense. In this shot, we can clearly see that Katara reaches out for Aang with her right hand, but then in the next shot, she's holding him with her left hand. This is a really beautiful moment, and I feel like if I talk about it too much, I'll just ruin it. It speaks for itself, really really strong moment. This episode's great. Katara really shines, like I said. We basically get to see everyone of the gang with some key part of them taken away. Sokka loses his intellect, Toph still can't see, and Aang loses Appa, and pretty much himself along with him. Katara really pulls the group together, though. And it's because of episodes like this I could ever see eye to eye with the people that say Katara is an annoying character. Aang also gets a really interesting episode, seeing how he has to handle this situation that anyone would dread. And Iroh and Zuko have a fun little side story that sets them on the way to bossing Sei and sets up the Order of the White Lotus right here at the exact midpoint of the show. Really, really really strong all the way around. Sokka being high is fine, and it used to be a highlight for me, but not so much anymore. But I'm sure it still is for a lot of people, so I don't dock the episode many points for it at all. And I'm gonna go off script here for a second. I haven't written anything for this part, but um, we're officially halfway through the show at this point, like just, just over halfway, if you want to be a dick about it. But um, thanks everyone for, you know, tuning in. I really didn't think anyone was gonna watch these when I first started, and now I've got 9,000 people watching me, or at least I do at the time of recording this, so it's really cool that uh, people want to hear me talk about this kind of stuff. Um, especially the patrons, I'm going to do the patron shoutouts here in a second, but uh, yeah, really cool. Like, I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to um, tune in and, you know, take my opinions in, even though some of them aren't great. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. You've, you've made this whole thing really fun, and um, seeing all your comments and the likes, it, it really, it really touches the guy's heart, you know, so... Um, Thanks for the first half of the ride, and hopefully the second half's even better. All right, on to the patron shoutouts. Yep, patron shoutouts. If you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts go to my top patrons, Fred Sullivan, who was actually the rightful king to an African micro-nation, but he doesn't know that yet. Keegan Scott, who returned all of his library books on time, every time, and always remembered to tip the librarian. Skylo, son of Unthau Rakthrash, god of the platinum hell. And Zumpy, who got a date once by guessing the person's phone number correctly on the first guess. Other enormous shoutouts go to my other top patrons, Be My Valentine, Code Canut, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Eleonora Rose, Garmer, Glintlock, Most Super of Snippers, Nicholas Abbott, Praker Gas, and Tiago Nascimento. Next up is The Serpent's Past, the reunion episode. There's no way that anything that comes up in that episode would ever go wrong in the long run, right? 